Buffett, he wrote one letter a year. So only one. And it's not that long. It's like 10 plus pages. Yeah, the content itself is very good. Okay, the first page, right? Of course, you know, uh, Charlie Munger passed away uh, last year. I think he wrote a very touching piece. Uh, I think everyone should just go and read that. Uh, basically, he really credited Charlie Munger as the architect of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, in, in, in the early years, right? Actually, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is a textile business. Buffett bought the business is also because it is very cheap. And then after he bought it, he have difficulty because that textile businesses is very competitive although he, he can still generate earnings from the business but then it just requires more and more capital expenditure to, to keep up with the competitions uh. so it makes the business not an attractive one and then with the guidance from Charlie Munger actually they pivoted from textile business to other businesses uh, meaning he take the free cash flow and then just go and buy other businesses for those who follow Buffett you also know that in his early years he talked about like all this value investing uh, buying uh, cigarette puff companies so these are companies that's very very cheap buy it while it's cheap when the share price revert to the intrinsic value and then he will just sell it off so th that was his uh, initial strategy he, he pivoted from this strategy to just focusing on buying quality business like wonderful business uh, businesses like coca-cola businesses that he actually hold on until now uh, for example the insurance business as well so all, all these core businesses so his style is really like buy all these business and then just as much as possible just hold on instead of like keep keep on trading uh, uh, nevertheless, Charlie in 1965 promptly advised me, Warren, forget about buying another company like Berkshire, like meaning cheap companies, right? But now that you control Berkshire, add to it wonderful businesses purchase at fair prices and give up buying fair businesses at wonderful prices. In other words, abandon everything you learn from your hero Ben Graham. It works, but only when practiced at small scale. With much backsliding, I subsequently followed his instructions. So I think basically he's comparing uh, different two different types of businesses, right? The first type is like companies that are really cheap. Like you look at it, you look at the fundamentals, look at the earnings, everything. And then you look at the prices, it's like, okay, no need to argue, it is cheap. But some of these companies, in terms of how wonderful the business model, the mode and so on, is so-so, you know? So, and then there are another type of business. You look at today's fundamental, you look at today's the reven uh, revenue margin, profit and so on. Even the growth rate you put into it, right? You will think that, okay, maybe it is, you know, like expensive. But you look at the mode, you look at the uh, competitive advantage and so on, right? You know that this company is wonderful business. It's like companies that can compound over time, right? So between these two type of companies, some people who pay a lot more attention to the uh, value side, right? Meaning that they, 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 they can't convince themselves to buy a business that looks as expensive, right? So they, they will want to buy cheap companies, right? The other types is that, okay, people who just like forget about the, uh, value investing for a second just focus on the quality of the business and as soon as it's a quality business they, you will just accumulate over time of course you can still accumulate accumulate more when the prices become more attractive and maybe accumulate less when the the company is like pricey at the moment right so you can you can mix these two approaches actually when comparing value versus the quality right actually the quality is even more important whether a business can compound or cannot compound i think that will play a much significant role if your time horizon is very long so i think this is very important point because there are still many people who who don't appreciate much on this so so i just draw a few like diagram just to you know uh, illustrate to you like what is the difference between these two right this is like the so-called the value investing right buy fair businesses at wonderful price fair meaning is like so so like like not a wonderful business but it's okay-ish business the red color is the share price the dotted line here this is the intrinsic value so i still assuming that the business the intrinsic value still can go up over time okay this is the intrinsic value for those who focus on the value right they will look for this type of opportunity where you know the price suddenly drop way below the intrinsic value so this is the distance right so they look for this kind of opportunity because why because they believe that whenever the price right get below the intrinsic value right it will tend to revert back to, to its intrinsic value because the intrinsic value this one depends depending on the growth of the business depending on the margin but this red line that zigzagging right this is because of the sentiment sometimes sentiment is good it, it just uh, went past the intrinsic value but sometimes when the sentiment was bad it, it just went way below the intrinsic value right so you buy it here to take advantage of the reversion back to the intrinsic value so this dotted line is what the value investor is betting on and it can be very lucrative uh, especially when when 
when the prices get way below the intrinsic value so that, that's the first condition second condition is that the intrinsic value right it doesn't go down it's like it's here we, we still assume it is like steadily going up right so you just capture this reversion back to the intrinsic value that is like okay good returns already that's the first type the so-called the value investing right now go to the second type second type is like okay now we just focus of buying wonderful business so again i have two lines here okay this is the the dotted line the intrinsic value and then this is the share price right for wonderful business right usually the intrinsic value it will go up and it won't just go up like you know two percent per year if it is a wonderful business you will notice that the uh, intrinsic value themselves right just because of the growth just because they are better at competing with others they have certain modes so this intrinsic value will compound at a, at a higher rate so you can see that this exponential uh, upward in the intrinsic value right so this is the first characteristic right now even if current share price is it looks high compared to today's intrinsic value but you know that it is going to you know compound over time at decent better than average rate so the question is would you want to buy here right this is the dilemma because usually the companies that that is wonderful right it won't look cheap one it's very unlikely that you one person realize that this company is wonderful usually other people also also realize they also know about it so the difference of those who buy versus those who don't buy is that whether you are willing to pay a bit of premium sometimes it's a bit of premium sometimes it's a lot of premium right depending on the mood at the time right whether you are willing to pay the premium to buy a wonderful business right so that's the that's the key differences and then of course for those who focus a lot on the value right you will think that oh like if i buy now you see it's above the uh, above the intrinsic value what what if it suddenly come down right so that's always the fear like like what i buy above intrinsic value um then it dropped below the intrinsic value then i look stupid man so so i think that's the the fear and and you always wanted to buy at cheap right? but the the problem is that some people who just keep on waiting to buy at a cheap price let's say if the price like doesn't go below or reaching the intrinsic value it's just hovering above it right and just zigzagging up right so you are not able to buy it right so so that's the that's the dilemma right but i think for those who don't mind buying at so-called premium price because they know that the business has intrinsic value that is going up fast right so to them it's like no 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 worry even if it come down right eventually it will go back up because the intrinsic value compound at a higher rate so this is the the thing right as long as it is wonderful business you you have high confidence that the intrinsic value will just go up and and go up at, at a decent rate but the, the the question is that sometimes it's not that easy to differentiate between fair business versus a wonderful business because some business that looks wonderful currently may suddenly turn out to become like a oh a social business because all these things is not uh static right uh, it changes from time to time because a wonderful business businesses like kodak or the polaroid right th these businesses they used to be wonderful business at their time but suddenly all this uh, disruption suddenly come and then a wonderful business suddenly become not wonderful anymore so i think that's also another another challenges right it's like you buy a premium thinking that it is wonderful suddenly it turned out isn't wonderful right so that that's another uh different risk now. yeah i think that's the, the the diagram that i try to illustrate to you all like okay what, what are the differences uh, between these two the, are you really like so-called the value investing that just focusing on buying on the cheap or are you you know investor that that is okay and willing to pay some premium but just really focus on buying wonderful business la. questions from obelu strawberry how do you know the intrinsic value in order to know the price is lower than it uh i, I think these questions right is that you need to know some form of valuation like you want to know how to value because the intrinsic value right is uh it's not a concept that is like this you, you can approach it from a quantitative basis but actually there's a lot of qualitative uh, element into it as well the quantitative end right is that you can do uh, dcf or the discounted cash flow approach right meaning that you try to come up with an uh, assumption like what is the growth rate of the business what is the margin in the future and then derive the cash flow and then discount it back that's your intrinsic value right so that's the quantitative side the qualitative side is that not everyone agree with your growth rate you look at the business maybe currently it's growing at 20 percent we don't know what is the growth rate in the future right it could be you know stay at 20 percent it could be even higher at 30 percent or it could come down to five percent right so you really need to use all available informations to guesstimate meaning that you guess but you, you at the same time you estimate right you you try to guess where's the growth rate you try to guess whether they are able to maintain the margin or not so come up with your assumptions and and calculate the intrinsic value yourself so of course you you need to know the characteristic of the business you need to understand the, the business model you need to understand why this company is able 
able to increase their market share you need to in, uh, understand how big is the total addressable market and so on so there's still a lot of uh, research that is needed to come up with this uh, intrinsic value la. so that's the more comprehensive way to, to cal- calculate an, an intrinsic value la. let's continue writer find it useful to picture the reader they seek and often they are hoping to attract a mass audience at Berkshire we have a more limited target investors who trust Berkshire with their savings without any expectations of resale I think this is very important because when Buffett wrote this letter right he has very like a targeted readers so he's not writing to someone who just you know hold on to Berkshire because they are trading right so he really write to someone in his mind is that this person already holding uh, Berkshire uh, shares for you know like 5 years 10 years some, some actually hold these shares for you know like 10, 20, 30 years right so even if you watch the uh, you know the annual shareholder meetings right there, there are investors that just you know introduce themselves I'm who and who from where Berkshire Hathaway investor for 15 years so so you know they are they really try their best to attract a long term investor that's why you, you see when market you know like sometimes there's crisis sometimes there's volatility no, nobody really worry about you know uh, Berkshire share prices because this group of investors they are you know the, the, the percentage of trader actually uh, relatively small most of them are long term investors and, and these are the investors who, who are you know accumulating or who are just holding right this long term investor base really important in you know anchoring the share price now. but of course there's still sellers I think sellers are mostly those who already invested for you know like 10 20 years they already quite big from the companies and, and they just you know they are retiring now they just need to share sell some of the shares and to fund their retirement from a company's perspective right sometimes I think the learning points here is that it's not enough just to operate your business sometimes it's really important to cultivate a bunch of investors who really invest in you on a long term basis rather than you know like just serving them uh, a good quarters or a good year result you, you need to you know find an uh, investor that is think alike and in sync with you uh, and if that's the case because the expectation everything is like in line right so there won't be much disappointment uh, throughout this relationship right so I think this is quite quite uh, Im- important one and the second one is that here uh, Buck, uh, what Buffett say they are this group of investor uh, they are entitled to hear every year both the good and bad news delivered directly from their CEO and not from an investor relations officer or communications consultant forever serving up optimism and syrupy mush this is also very important and this is not so much about investing you know to me this is more like a leadership skill or a leadership responsibility Buffett if he like right he can just appoint someone as a CEO and he just pull the trigger from from uh, behind right and let the CEO manage all the operations right and he can just you know like relax right but no he, he know that he is the CEO he pull the trigger he make the decisions but when it comes to communicating with the shareholders right he do it himself every year very consistent there's this letter that come up explain to the uh, shareholders like what are the bad news what are the good news uh, he screw up he also share so I think this is the part that you know as an investor people want like this direct communications from the CEO himself so I would say that actually there are many many companies the CEO will just outsource this part to whether it's like consultant or to the marketing or to someone else right that do all these communications they don't communicate like one-to-one basis to the investors and sometimes even to the employee also I, I don't know whether there's meaningful communication in, in this type of like 10 plus pages letters just to share you know the important things the good news the bad news right so I think this type of like one-to-one uh, communications is like really really helpful and really really build trust uh. and I really think that for those who are leaders right or uh, let's say you listening you aspire to be a leader you really need to pick up this I think this is not just a skill it's a skill and also a responsibility that you really need to communicate directly by writing letter by using video forms just talk to the people like on a one-to-one kind of basis instead of going through intermediary so I think this is good uh, leadership qualities okay that's on the leadership the next one which I think is interesting is because sometimes you know like uh, Buffett he will pull out things from the past his his initial years of experience and so on so here I just pick one example so okay this is him the second paragraph here he, his sharing of his first stock purchase okay i can't remember a period since march 11 1942 the date of my first stock purchase so that's like i don't know what 80 years ago that i have not had a majority of my net worth in equities u.s based equities uh, very specific here and so far so good the Dow Jones industrial average fell below 100 on that fateful day in 1942 when i pulled the trigger 
I was down about $5 by the time school was out. Soon things turn around and now that index hovers around 38000 America has been a terrific country for investors. All they have needed to do is sit quietly listening to no one. There are a few things that I, w- I want to you know, like, uh, stress on on this paragraph here. Okay? He started investing like many, many years ago and that's how he compounded his you know, net worth to huge numbers. When he started investing, he has seen that the Dow Jones uh, industry average fall below 100. To him, right, that that, that drop right on that day right is like big drop but you just fast forward right that index alone from 100 can become 38,000 that is like 380 times just want to you know stress on that as long as your time horizon is long enough right actually you don't really need to worry about wow today S&P 500 is 5,000 later drop to 4,800 later go up back up to 5,200 go down to 4,500 this type of you know volatility it looks like very you know dramatic very exciting but if you can just skip past all these short term fluctuations right just think about like not just you know like talking about months talking about what will happen this year or, or this month or six months from now just focusing on your portfolio and just focusing on like skip forward 10 years 20 years 30 years because let's say even if you are let's say 40 years old or 50 years old right your investing journey it will still be you know like 10 20 years down the road right at least or, or 30 years down the road and just skip past all this and think of like long-term basis right don't have to worry on on this like i can imagine s&p 500 from today's 5000 to become 50000 it, it, it not of course it's not going to 10x in like you know three years five years ten years right you probably need longer like maybe 30 years from from now but still my investing journey is like longer right i will see the day when s&p 500 really reaching 50000 if you just see past all this fluctuation right actually as soon as you just you know like sit quietly less listening to no one by listening to no one means that you don't listen to people listen to news and go and sell your shares uh. so so by just holding on long term actually your portfolio is fine right so that's why the the focus on the long term one is really really important if you have long horizon uh. and here by long horizon you can see that buffett he can recall the day he bought his shares and since then the stock market has went up 380 times right so i think this is really like a good good reminder to to know that as long as a uh, stock market can compound over time right your investment will be fine it, it, it will perform decently as long as you don't do stupid things on on a short-term basis uh. so yeah that's the takeaway from this uh and just bring up some chart to to illustrate you see this is the chart uh because i i, I think it pulls out s p 500 because it's more relevant to us here in in the 40s it's like going flat but because stock market compound over time right it, it will be fine you know this is like just the businesses grown your investment will, will just go up over time uh. so this is on log scale basis because of the risk premium is still there although it is like lesser compared to the past but but still healthy risk uh, premium there you are fine if, if you can just hold on for the long term okay okay the next one uh within capitalism some businesses will flourish for a long for a very long time while others will prove to be sinkholes it's harder than you would think to predict which will be the winners and losers and those who, who tell you they know the answer are usually either self-delusional or stake oil salesmen. I think this is also a good reminder because nowadays people consume uh, you know, uh, content on like, for example, eggs on YouTube. You're listening to people who are very confident because to, for those people who are, uh, uh, they, 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 they sound like don't know this, don't know that. It's not convincing, right? And usually those people who are very, very convincing in telling the story, buy this company, it will, it will go up, buy that companies. This company will do better than the other companies. You know, this kind of message, right? It's like the people sounds very confident and, and that make the content very engaging and, and that's where uh, it can viral, right? Just be, you know, realistic about it. It's not easy to, to you know, like differentiating a company's that will turn out to become winner versus a loser. This is never easy. And those who sound very confident, right? Usually, you know, they are either self-delusional or uh, state oil salesmen, right? So you need to be very careful when, when you hear someone who, who is very confident on, on some things, right? So I think this is always a, a good reminder. Sir. Okay, so then he, he uh, moved on to talk about the two investments that Berkshire had a way to maintain the positions indefinitely. So basically, it become like a long-term investment, sir, similar to Coke and American Express, sir, okay? So the company that he mentioned is uh, this Occidental Petroleum. So I think this is also quite interesting because um, basically he mentioned that not so long ago, right, actually US, because the, their productions of oil isn't that high. So their demand on all this energy uh, actually m- much higher than the supply. So they actually rely on, you know, uh, Middle East countries to supply the oil. That's why there's a reliance there. 
So and then it recently because of all these, you know, shell uh, gas productions, right? That the economics become feasible, right? And this is not that long ago. This this was since you know like, uh, 2011, the energy dependency ended. So now the U.S. production is more than 13 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. Okay, this is the units, lah. Okay, uh, OPEC no longer has the upper hand. Occidental itself has annual U.S. oil production that each year come close to matching the entire inventory of the SPR. The SPR is this strategic petroleum reserve. Lah. So this is like a, a, a reserve just for, you know, like uh, emergency use. Lah. So I think this one, I, I'm aware of this uh, shell gas uh, production in U.S. It's just that I, I don't know how big is the production, right? So here it mentioned that it's like almost matching the entire inventory of the SPR. This is new to me. I, I didn't know before uh, I read about this. The key point here is to say like two things, right? One is that Berkshire businesses, right? They don't really focus on like, you know, uh, invest better than the other and have yearly outperformance. So that's never their, their goal. Their goal is really to buy, you know, businesses that form the strong pillar of US economies. Lah. So in this case, right, the energy uh, and also another business, which is their railway, right? That he also mentioned in, in the letter. Energy business because like a strong uh, anchor so he really like to buy this type of businesses and maybe you know he see it from two fronts like, I think one is that all these businesses is still like earning decent returns and secondly he really like you know try to you know like support back US economy right so it's kind of like giving back to the to the country because I think maybe some you know there's still all this ESG concern right it, all these businesses because people don't want to buy because it's like you know not ESG friendly the pricing also get attractive maybe that's also one reason why he keep on buying another is that he want all these businesses that he just hold on generating free cash flow and and just just keep on uh you know like throw back the cash to Berkshire la. so he has been accumulating this out businesses for quite long la. so that's why if you just want to you know aim for like 20 percent per year you are not able to get it la. so these are businesses I think although the returns is like should be higher than uh U.S. Treasury bill of course but it's not going to generate you know like the 20 30 percent kind of returns la. but but still uh he like businesses that generating free cash flow I like this part okay this is the part when he compare uh, the annual percentage change in the market value of Berkshire versus S&P 500, right? So you can see that his compound return is 20% versus 10% of S&P 500, right? But over a long period of time, you can see that it's really, really different. Although you can say, oh, it's only 2x, 20% versus 10%, only 2x. But compounded over a long period of time, it's like very, very different. Another reminder is that, you know, there are people who say, wow, getting what? 20% is nothing. You need to aim for, you know, like sniper. You need to aim for 30, 50% return per year. So actually, you don't need to do that because even the, you know, the god of investing, right? Uh, the oracle of Omahara, he's only getting 20%. And 20% for a long period of time is a, like very, very impressive kind of track records. Uh. But the thing is not about the 20% because if you're only able to generate 20% in two years or three years and then you lo lose big money, it's actually useless, you Know? the important thing is that you need to compile at a decent rate by decent I mean 10% also decent and of course if you can do better than S&P 500 that's even better right but the, the even the harder part is the, the long period of compounding and that's why the, the long term investing is all about long period of compounding right so I think that's very very important so as a reminder, you see, he also, you know, his uh, net worth also, you know, hovering around like one, two, ten millions for a long period of time, right? And then because of the compounding start kicking in in his 50s, 60s and 70s, right? Now his net worth is, is like what, 80 plus billions. And that is after he made tons of, uh, you know, the, the donations, right? So if he, he haven't donated those net worth or, or shares away, right? Actually, his his um net worth is even even higher. So again, it's just an update, right? I, like how to uh, link it back to our investment, right? So this is my you know compositions of my portfolio. There's stocks, there's ETF. Uh, I also put the S and P five hundred. Of course, over time when S and P five hundred go up, my portfolio goes up, and and when S and P five hundred down, my portfolio also down, right? So I think this is just part of the market, right? But how to link it back is that just just look at this right as like this is the compounding machines that will continue to go up over time and it go up for two reasons right one is that generally all these businesses as long as you hold good businesses you uh the it will worth more over time the intrinsic value will increase over time and secondly we still you know put all money into the investment into the portfolio and grow it even faster right so i think just treat this as a compounding machine and treat this as a long-term compounding machine like like you are managing this for you know for the 
uh, upcoming 10, 20, 30 years, 50 years, right? So I think we have, need to have this kind of mindset to, to you know, anchor uh, and to stay invested and don't focus too much on like those short-term trading stuff. Uh. So I think that's all my presentation on, on this today. Uh, hopefully see you next week. Uh. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.